Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali were two very different men, both in the way that they fought and in the way that they lived. But these two champions would come to define each other's place in history, each man bringing out the best in the other inside the ring and the worst outside of it. They would face off for the first time in 1971 in what came to be known as the fight of the century. When the match was first scheduled, both men's unorthodox techniques made it anyone's guess what would happen in the ring. Ali used complex footwork to circle his opponents from the outside, catching them with whipping jabs before dashing in to throw lightning fast combinations. In contrast, Frazier would drive directly at his opponents. Rather than use traditional footwork to cut off the ring, Frazier would just charge straight in, counting on his cross guard and phenomenal head movement to keep him safe. Both Frazier and Ali had some of the best defense of all time, but once again, were polar opposites in the way they went about it. Frazier used his erratic head movement to make his opponents miss, ducking in under their punches to catch them with his powerful gazelle hook. In contrast, Ali would lean far back, making his opponents chase him and overreach so that he could land a perfectly placed counter punch. Frazier took his power from the ground, exploding off of his deep crouch. Ali got his power from his opponents, tricking them into stepping into his punches for him. Both men were similar in that they wore their opponents down over time. Frazier with constant wrestling and body shots, and Ali with lightning fast jabs that cut and swelled his opponent's eyes and took the air out of their lungs. But this match was more than just a clash of styles. Several elements combined to make this fight transcend boxing in the eyes of the public. Ali had recently come off of a three-year suspension, having lost his license for refusing to be drafted into the Vietnam War, a war he did not agree with. As a result, Ali had been stripped of his title. But after three years of trying, he'd regained his boxing license, and the world witnessed the rare occurrence of two undefeated heavyweight champions, both with legitimate claims to the title, squaring off in the ring. At the time of the fight, Ali was waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on his case, and he knew that at any moment, he could lose his appeal and spend five years in prison. Frazier was one of the few boxers who refused to call Ali by his chosen name, and had been among the first to condemn Ali's decision not to be drafted into the war. As a result, Ali was relentless in his attacks on Frazier, framing himself as a proud fighter against oppression, and framing Frazier in most ways unfairly, as the antithesis of everything he stood for. When Frazier and Ali stepped into the ring, to many they were not mere men, but champions of their causes, ready to perform trial by combat for their respective sides. Feeling betrayed and cast as the villain, Frazier came to deeply hate Muhammad Ali. In his locker room before the fight, Frazier prayed and asked God to help him kill Ali, as he was not a righteous man. The time came, and the men stepped into the ring. To give a small idea of the epic proportions this fight had grown to, Archie Moore was to announce the fight. Frank Sinatra, unable to get tickets, had agreed to take pictures for the newspapers. In Ireland, the mass riots that had crippled the nation came to a halt, as the men cleared the streets so as not to miss this fight. And in the ring, the two fighters squared off, Ali yelling threats, Frazier staring back with fire in his eyes, before finally uttering, I'm gonna kill you. The bell rang. Ali had promised this would be an easy fight, no competition. And in the first three rounds, Ali seemed to deliver on his promise. His plan for the fight was not to dance, but to keep Frazier in the center of the ring and punish him with grounded, hard punches. When Frazier got close enough to land, Ali would move laterally, or tie Frazier up and turn him, regaining the center of the ring. For this plan to work, Ali needed to be able to consistently catch Frazier, a man with one of the best defenses in the history of the heavyweight division. But astonishingly, it seemed he could. Ali was the first opponent that Frazier had faced with the talent to read his erratic rhythm, the reflexes to spot small openings, and the speed to take advantage of them. During each round, the two men fought with their words as well as their fists, hurling insults at each other between exchanges. 
While the crowd roared every time Fraser landed with his left, they were few and far between. And Fraser had not done any real damage to the ex-champ as he walked back to his corner at the end of the third. But Fraser had been establishing and improving certain techniques over the last three rounds that should have greatly concerned Ali. First, Fraser had been sneaking in tight, hard shots to the body each time Ali tied him up. Fraser was no stranger to grappling, and had learned through years of trial and error that it was often best to go with the movements of the opponent. And so, rather than struggle against the bigger man like a novice, Fraser would pull his arm back when Ali tried to stifle his blows, throwing around his guard. He would also catch Ali just as he tried to disengage, taking advantage of the small, brief openings provided. The punches were few and far between, but it was a start. And although Ali had done the impossible and gotten inside Frazier's rhythm, Frazier had been learning Ali's timing as well and mapping out the holes in his defense. While Frazier had a hard time countering Ali's right, he had found that he could weave outside Ali's lead hook to connect with near impunity. The position and angle of this punch is something far more likely to be thrown by a crafty southpaw, and it repeatedly caught Ali by surprise. This had awarded Frazier the ability to drive Ali to the ropes, although he hadn't, as of yet, done any meaningful damage. Frazier had built the foundations for these techniques in the first three rounds, and now, heading into the fourth, they were about to pay dividends. Round four began. At first, Ali continued to punish Frazier as he chased Ali in circles around the ring. But then, deep into the round, Frazier landed the first of his hooks to truly shake Ali. Driven back to the ropes, Ali tried to clinch, but Frazier broke through, targeting Ali's body and smashing tight, hard shots into his ribs and hips. Ali came back, landing hard, but then he took another tremendous hook as the round came to an end. Frazier had now established his lead hook, proving to Ali that this would be no easy fight. Round five would bring out the best in both fighters. Ali came out circling, with Frazier deftly evading his punches and pressing forward. Ali caught Frazier with a hard right, whipping his head back. This punch would have put many of Ali's former competitors to sleep, much as any one of the terrifying hooks Frazier landed on Ali would have put his opponents to sleep. Frazier kept coming, but Ali had stopped throwing the wide hook that had kept getting him into trouble, and it started to effectively forearm block and deflect Frazier's best weapon. When Ali landed another solid one too, Frazier had had enough. Frazier lowered his hands and taunted Ali, daring him to hit him. Ali would later describe this round in depth, my jabs bounced off his head, but he keeps coming. Why is he so confident? I can feel it. So confident that near the end of the fifth, he drops both hands, jeers at me, dares me. I take the dare. Frazier taunted and laughed at Ali as he missed, just as Ali had done to so many great boxers in the past. But Frazier was not the only one with nerves of steel. Ali kept throwing until he found his target. He landed a barrage of sharp rice to Frazier's temple but Frazier didn't seem to care. By the end of the round, Ali had gained a newfound respect for Joe Frazier. Round five had been dramatic, but fairly even. Round six would not be. Ali had confidently predicted that Frazier would fall in the sixth, but this was one of the few predictions in Ali's career that he would get entirely wrong. Frazier was well aware of Ali's prediction, and so, true to his nickname, Frazier came out smoking. He pinned Ali against the ropes, stabbing a hard shot into Ali's side to get him to lower his guard, before slamming a powerful lead hook into his chin. Ali would later say that he felt paralyzed after that punch. As the crowd cheered Frazier on, Ali was not trying to land a knockout. He was trying to survive. But he knew if he could just hold on a little longer, make it through the round, he could recover and get his second wind. Ali managed a few solid combinations, but spent most of the round against the ropes trying to regain his energy, Frazier destroying his ribs and hips. Targeting the hips was a common tactic of Joe Frazier, who realized at some point in his career that damaging an opponent's hips greatly diminishes their movement, in the same way targeting an opponent's legs does in MMA. 
In fact, many of Frazier's former rivals were reminded of him each time they took a step, for days after the fight. And Ali would later say that his hips felt like they'd been beaten with a baseball bat. Mercifully, the bell finally rang. Back in his corner, it was Frazier's turn to be impressed, asking his trainer, what's holding this guy up? Ali regained his senses in the seventh, again managing to catch Frazier as he came in. Frazier took three or four shots for everyone he landed, but Ali was still exhausted, and by the end of the round, he had walked himself to the corner, fighting in something close to a Philly shell. In his corner, Ali had a terrifying thought. What if all of his detractors were right? What if three years out of the ring had taken his stamina, and there was no second win coming? In the eighth, the last of Ali's energy finally seemed to have left him. He lay against the ropes, trying to clown to buy time, hoping that maybe Frazier would get angry and make a mistake. But he didn't. Frazier smelled blood, and midway through the round, he tore Ali off the ropes, just to chase him back and unleash his anger on him again. Frazier had told Ali during their meeting years earlier, you ain't never had to dig before. Every time you breathe, you be breathing right down on my head. There's another reason Ali was so tired, beyond the incredible blows that he had taken and beyond his three years of inactivity. This was what Joe Frazier's style was designed to do. Rather than try to regain his posture when Ali leaned on him, tiring himself needlessly, Frazier would use his lower center of gravity to drive Ali to the ropes. Frazier had crowded Ali every second of the fight, never giving him a second to breathe, punching relentlessly, fainting and milling, keeping him worried, tiring his body and his mind. Ali made it through, and as he walked back to his corner, he knew if he wanted to win this fight, he would have to dig. In the ninth round, Ali came out determined to turn the fight around. He began to find his footing. As Frazier charged in, Ali's strength returned to him. His vision focused, and he began to connect again. Leading with his right, he landed cross after cross, for the first time in the fight, Frazier backed up. And for the first time since his three-year exile from the ring, Ali looked for a moment like the Ali of old. At the end of the round, Frazier was bleeding from the mouth, nose, and a cut above his eye. But just like Ali, there was no quit in Joe Frazier. The 10th round was when Frazier told the press he would take Ali out of the fight for good. Frazier determined to turn his prediction into reality through everything he had at Ali. But unlike the sixth, Ali was ready, and both men gave as good as they got. Ali caught Frazier as he came in, but Frazier caught Ali every time he crowded him on the ropes. This had now become an established pattern in the fight, with Ali landing several shots as Frazier backed him up, and Frazier landing a few hard shots as Ali tried to reposition himself back to the center of the ring. If this pattern continued, Ali could win by taking the remaining rounds on points. Frazier knew he needed to do something soon, and in the 11th, he got his chance. Ali had always counted on his reflexes. His distance and timing were so great that he could make an opponent miss by less than an inch, and then lead him right into return fire. But Ali's opponents had never leaped into their punches, and Frazier was able to travel enough distance to surpass the remarkable range of motion Ali had in his upper body. Ali had boasted that he had the answer to Joe's hook, that he would simply lean back and move. Frazier had shot back, but I go to the body first, I get the head another time. His words turned out to be prophetic. Frazier caught Ali with what he would later describe as the hardest punch he'd ever taken in his life. Ali fell, and the ref ruled it a slip. While his true Ali did slip, it's unlikely he would have if he had not been first wobbled by Joe Frazier's punch. Ali shook his head and walked right up to Frazier, but he was shaken and his reflexes were dulled. Ali couldn't seem to find the time to recover, and as the round went on, he was getting destroyed. Frazier was doing his best to keep Ali in the corner, but for Ali's part, he had to stay on the ropes anyways. They were the only thing keeping him up. So Ali tried to fight from the corner, popping out of his guard to insult Frazier before covering up again. He would steady himself, 
land flurries where he could, and then hold on again. But then, just as it seemed he may have recovered, Fraser caught Ali with a devastating blow to the jaw, followed by a deep, shearing shot across the stomach that bent him over, and then one more tight hook to the head that buckled his knees. Now, Fraser thought, now I have him. But Ali tied up Fraser, leaned on him, circled away. Fighting entirely on instinct, Ali flicked out two light jabs, moved with another hook, tried to tie up Fraser again. Fraser landed through Ali's guard, and Ali made a funny face at him. In probably the most Muhammad Ali moment of the fight, Ali clowned his rival during the biggest fight in the history of the world as he was seconds away from getting knocked out. And then, Ali kept fighting, looking like he was moving through quicksand, taking another thunderous hook to the jaw that whipped his head around. But still, he was on his feet. Still, he was fighting. Frazier threw himself across the ring, missing Ali by an inch, crashing into him so hard that he spun him around. Ali staggered back dramatically, and Frazier hesitated. It seemed there was a method to Ali's madness. Ali had clowned Frazier so much before that Frazier now thought Ali had recovered and was faking being hurt entirely, which was exactly what Ali wanted him to think. If Frazier had taken the opportunity, the fight may well have ended here. But he did hesitate, and Ali clinched, countered, clowned some more, and then the bell rang. As Ali wobbled to his corner, the physician went to make sure he was still okay to fight, and his corner tried every trick in the book to revive him. There were four rounds left, more than enough time to finish the job, thought Frazier. Frazier hit Ali with everything he had in the 12th, but Ali was showing the world something that he had never needed to show them before, that Ali didn't just have great defense, he had a great jaw for when that defense failed. After failing to knock out Ali in the 12th, Frazier was absolutely certain that in the next round, finally, Ali would fall. But, to quote Joe Frazier, in the 13th round, the butterfly got his wings back. Ali summoned the last of his reserves, and through the next two rounds, he danced around Joe Frazier when he could, and leaned on him to stay on his feet when he couldn't. In the meantime, Frazier was finally showing himself to be human. With his pace slowed and his reflexes dulled, Ali picked at him, connecting almost at will. At the end of the 13th, Ali did something he'd never done before. He leaned in and fought Frazier on the inside, trading him blow for blow. In the 14th, both men scored heavily, with Frazier mostly targeting the body. Defense no longer seemed to be a top priority for either of them. They simply wanted to land, at any cost. By the final round, both men had been beaten badly. Both of Frazier's eyes were closing, and Ali's jaw was visibly swollen. He had pulled off a miracle 15th round knockout in his very last fight, and he knew he had the power to do it again. And Frazier? Frazier wanted Ali down. As he later explained, My adrenaline made me feel no pain. I didn't want to beat this guy. I wanted to knock him out. I kept moving forward letting the punches fly. Hit me, I hit you. I don't give a damn. I come to destroy you, Clay. Midway through the round, Ali saw his opening. He stepped back at an angle and prepared to throw his right hand, hoping to catch Frazier moving into his punch the same way he had caught Liston years before. But Frazier had seen an opening as well. He had gotten his distance by landing low, and now he loaded all of his power into his legs. At the same time, both men threw. But Frazier's timing was perfect, and he put everything he had into landing this one punch. Leaping off of his feet, Frazier propelled himself across the ring. Ali's punch landed harmlessly off target, and Frazier's landed flush on Ali's jaw. The greatest crashed to the canvas. Frazier had told Ali all those years ago. They talk about how fast you is moving away. But you're going to see how fast I am moving in. This one punch had sealed the deal. 
cementing Frazier's victory, and finally, establishing him as the true heavyweight champion of the world. Ali rose to his feet, but the fight was lost. He tried his hardest, but without a knockout, the remainder of the round was nothing more than a formality. Frazier had silenced his critics and gotten the revenge he so desperately craved. After his three-year journey to regain his license, fight for his cause, and get his title back, Al Lee had lost everything. This was not the end of Ali and Frazier. The two would meet two more times, and their rivalry would not diminish, but grow to epic proportions. But for now, Ali would need to fight his way back to another chance at becoming champion. In his way stood Ken Norton, and Frazier would continue his domination at heavyweight, heading on a collision course with a powerful young boxer by the name of George Foreman. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for more technique and fight breakdowns. You can check out my podcast, Striking Thoughts, where I go into everything from martial arts philosophy, the history of combat sports, and upcoming fights. If you want to learn how to generate power like your favorite fighters, you can check out my book, Power of the Pros, or pre-order my book, Footwork Wins Fights, out next month. All of this is linked in the description and the comments below. From the Modern Martial Artist, this has been David Christian, wishing you... Happy training.